This episode contains content that may not be suitable for some listeners, involving the discussion of several heinous crimes, involving religious coercion, kidnapping, molestation involving acts of incest and rape, suicide, and mass murder. Listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome back to Rogue Darkness, the podcast that uncovers how the misinterpretations and misinformation surrounding witchcraft, the occult, and other beliefs have led many to do unthinkable crimes. From ritualistic killings and the demons that live in all of us, to exploration of the macabre and delving deep into the unknown, let's explore the darkness of mankind, one crime at a time. I'm your host of The Grim and Gruesome, Raven. Let's go rogue and get right in to today's chilling crime. The twisted case of the Vampire King cult, which was led by Marcus Wesson. Traveling over to Fresno, a city located in the heart of California, known for its beautiful parks, vibrant nightlife, and delicious cuisine. But beneath the surface of the seemingly normal city, there was a monster lurking from within its shadows. That monster's name was Marcus Wesson. In the rundown office building on West Hammond Avenue, Marcus lived with his family in a world filled with immense darkness and terror. Inside the building, the air was heavy with the stench of decay and neglect. Against one wall, several coffins were stacked up, a reminder of the death that surrounded them. The building itself seemed to ooze with malevolent energy, as if the very walls themselves were alive with the secrets that lie inside. The windows of the building were boarded up, blocking out the sunlight and trapping the inhabitants inside a world of perpetual darkness. 911, what is your emergency? On March 12th, 2004, police officers were called to this very house on West Hammond Avenue in Fresno, California. To the unsuspecting officers, it seemed like any other domestic violence call. There had been reports of a heated argument over child custody that was breaking out. So the officers arrive at the residence, expecting to defuse the tension and send the family on their way. Little did they know, they were walking into a horrific cesspool involving incest, rape, and mass murder. Once there, the officers speak to Ruby Ortiz and Sofina Solario, along with some family members who were with them. The family members are extremely worried to the point of panic, claiming that their children are being held captive inside the rundown office building. They are adamant that the man inside, their uncle, Marcus Wesson, is going to hurt their children. Up to this point, the officers have no idea what they are in for. The police knock on the door to speak to Wesson and try to resolve the issue at hand. The door swings open. A tall, titanic, well-built man with graying dreadlocks down to his waist answers the door. His eyes are blank and soulless. Unlike the clearly upset women outside, Wesson is eerily calm. He agrees to turn over the children who he has custody of but wants to kiss them goodbye first. He asks the officers to wait outside while he goes back into the building, closing the door behind him. The mothers of the children wait. Without a warrant or any indication that there's a safety issue at hand, despite Ortiz and Solario's claims, the police don't have the authority to enter the house. So they wait, and they wait, and they wait. After nearly an hour and a half, Wesson finally walks out the front door. To everyone's shock and horror, his clothes are covered in blood. His hands are stained completely red, and his face expressionless. He doesn't say a word. Wesson surrenders himself to the officers, silently. As he surrenders to the resting officers... Other officers rush inside the home. Inside, despite the sunny afternoon, 
The building is dark and silent. Against one of the walls, there are twelve black oak coffins that are stacked up in a row. The officers then proceed to enter a back room. Inside, covered in blood, is a pile of bodies, some of which are children. Each had been shot through the eye. Because the bodies were in such a tangle, it would take many hours before the police could even determine how many victims there actually were, and it would be several days before they could all be identified. By the end of the grisly identification, the officers identified six slain children, one teenager, and one adult. The youngest of the children was only one years old, and the oldest was eight. But the worst was still yet to come. In trying to determine next of kin, the coroner had DNA testing done on all of the victims. When the results came back, the true extent of Marcus Wesson's depravity was finally revealed. Marcus Wesson, it was uncovered, always wanted to be a spiritual leader. He was born back in 1946, the oldest of four children, into what could only be called a dysfunctional family. His father, Benjamin, was an abusive alcoholic who never held down a steady job and once left the family for several years to live with another man. On the other hand, his mother, Carrie, was a strict Seventh-day Adventist who led the family in daily Bible studies and would often whip the children with an electrical cord. Despite all of this, though, as a child, Marcus was remembered by relatives as kind and even said to be a good singer. His favorite game as a child was playing preacher. Marcus dropped out of high school at 17 and went on to join the military, where he was said to be a medic or even possibly an ambulance driver. It's hard to say, as the sources tend to differ. He ultimately left the military, though, with an honorable discharge and went on to settle in San Jose, California. It was there in San Jose where he met Rosemary Maturena, a woman 13 years his senior who had eight children from previous relationships. None of Rosemary's children had a father that was actively present, and Marcus seemed to be intrigued by this and came off eager to take on such a big family. It was said that he believed that they needed a shepherd to guide them, and he was insistent on fulfilling that fatherly role that was missing from their life. Now together, the couple soon went on to have a son, together. At one point, one of Rosemary's older daughters, who was also named Rosemary, while struggling with drug addiction, dropped off her seven children with Marcus and her mother, bringing the number of children into the household up to 16. Now there was 16 young children in the house for Marcus to exert his domineering influence over. Despite wanting to have full control over the children, it was ultimately Rosemary's eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth, that Marcus was most fixated on. Marcus had claimed that God told him that Elizabeth was to be his wife, and he even held a home marriage ceremony to the child. He then took Elizabeth out of her school so he could begin personally teaching her. The teachings would include readings from a revised version of the Bible, where it claimed that Jesus Christ was actually a depraved vampire who would drink the blood of his disciples. When Elizabeth was just 12 years old, Marcus then began raping her. She never knew any different, and assumed this was what happened in every household. Shockingly, Rosemary's reaction to this was not to protect her own daughter, but instead, she merely insisted that they wait until Elizabeth was of legal age, 15, to get married. But unfortunately, at 14 years old, Elizabeth became pregnant with Marcus's baby, and the two were then legally wed. Marcus would go on to father 10 more children with Elizabeth before she reached the age of 26. Many people hearing this will likely wonder why Rosemary didn't protect her children from Marcus. 
Why did she allow such atrocities to take place within their family home? Her obedience most likely was the result of profound fear for both herself and her children, or possibly even brainwashing. But most likely, it was a combination of both. After all, Marcus's idea of shepherding the family was to rule over them with an iron fist. Marcus had made his family refer to him as master and lord. They never knew any different, and assumed this too was normal. He was a brutal abuser, beating the women and children with electrical cords, baseball bats, and his fists for the slightest of transgression. One of his sons, Serafino, recounted being beaten for 30 days straight for merely taking a spoonful of peanut butter without Marcus's approval. The children also recalled that Marcus had brutally beat their one-month-old infant, Jonathan, until the baby's legs bled. What was Marcus's motive for this barbaric abuse? He claimed it was because the baby, an innocent child, wouldn't stop crying. Because Marcus believed the world was full of sin, he isolated the family and forbade them to have contact with anyone of the outside world. All the children were homeschooled under his teachings as a means to control them even further. Once, when one of the children tried to leave, Marcus stabbed them in the chest. Marcus reportedly also liked moving the family around quite a lot, preventing the authorities from readily pinning them down and ultimately ending his horrific game. At one point in time, they lived in a rusted-out tugboat with no electricity or running water, where Marcus made the entire family stay below deck so they wouldn't be seen. When he would go out to the shore, he made the women row the raft like galley slaves. Then, for the better half of twelve years, they even lived in an old army tent. They also lived in a school bus for a while, moving up and down the California coast, before finally purchasing the old office building on Hammond Avenue. Daily life inside the Wesson household followed the playbook of every authoritarian cult. Each day, three times a day, Marcus got to play preacher in real life, subjecting the family to hours-long Bible studies that were based on his own made-up religious beliefs including that he was God, and that Jesus Christ was a vampire, and that the Bible taught young girls to perform oral sex starting at the age of eight. Unsurprisingly, though, he was fascinated by and felt a kinship with fellow cult leader David Koresh. During the 1993 siege of the compound in Waco, Marcus was glued to his TV. He told his family, this man is just like me. He is making children for the Lord. And, like Koresh, Marcus had a deep hatred of law enforcement. He even went on to mandate a suicide pact that if any government official ever tried to take the children away or split up the family, the mothers in the home were to kill their children and then kill themselves. Marcus held monthly family meetings to discuss the details of the plan. Every family member knew the inside out of the suicide pact and vowed to keep it. It is hard to express how completely Marcus controlled every aspect of his family's lives. The women and girls were especially subjugated. They had to dress in long skirts and headscarves, made to walk behind him at all times, and were to remain silent when in public. The women were forbidden to talk with men under punishment of beating. Even their own brothers and cousins were segregated away from them, lest they develop sexual feelings for other men. Their lives were filled with unending labor. They were responsible for taking care of the children as well as all the cleaning and cooking, even when there was no running water or electricity. They were also expected to wait on Marcus hand and foot, washing his massive dreadlocks and even scratching his armpit. In addition to all of this, anyone old enough to work outside the home was expected to do so and to hand over their wages 
directly to Marcus. As for Marcus, he refused to work, and instead drew welfare benefits. In such poverty, food was scarce. The children said they often had only rice to eat and would dig in dumpsters for food. Marcus, meanwhile, dined on fast food enough that by the time he was arrested, he weighed nearly 300 pounds and was so wide they needed three sets of handcuffs. But that is not even the worst of Marcus's crimes. As soon as the girls in his family, including his own blood nieces and daughters, reached the age of eight, Marcus began what he called lessons in loving their Lord. He would continuously rape them in their beds at night in order to teach them to be better women. Then he would marry each of them in his own little ceremony, where the girl would lie her hand upon the Bible, and then Marcus would lie his hand over hers, and they would both then recite marriage vows. Then Marcus would give the girl a gold wedding band and necklace. Marcus went on to father seven more children by his nieces and daughters. In his twisted beliefs, polygamy was mandatory, and incest, as he quoted, produces the seed of perfection of one's self. For most of the members of Marcus's family, this way of life was all they had ever known. But two of his nieces, Ruby Ortiz and Sofina Solorio, wanted out. Marcus eventually agreed that they could go, but only if they left their sons, Jonathan and Aviv, behind. Desperate to escape his evil grasp, the two women agreed. But as they adjusted to the world outside of Marcus's tight control, they started to understand what he did to them, what he was still doing to the rest of the family, and how it was incestuous rape and domestic violence. They finally saw the true light. And now we return to that fateful day, March 12th, 2004. They gathered several relatives for support and went back to the Wesson home to rescue their children, now both seven years old. That's when the shouting match broke out. Marcus remained calm, but refused to let Ruby or Sophina come inside the house to get their children. The women of the household shouted at them, calling them Judas, whores, and bitches, and commanding them to bow down to your master. As for Ruby and Sophina, they knew they had to get their children out of the house immediately. They were fully aware of the suicide pact the family had made, yet when the police arrived, they ignored the women's pleas that he was going to hurt the children, as well as one of Marcus's sons telling them his father owned a gun. Their warnings weren't considered enough evidence of a threat to the children's safety for them to force entry to the house. If only the police had entered the property, so many little lives could have been saved. This case was considered the worst mass murder in Fresno history, and the officers who encountered the bloody pile of children's bodies were so traumatized, they had to seek counseling. When Marcus Wesson appeared to stand trial a year later, he was a different man entirely. The man who once ruled over his family like a tyrant was now in shackles. Once he was a large, intimidating man, now, without a harem of women to cater to his every whim, he had dropped nearly half his weight. His dreadlocks, once past his waist, were now cut short. Marcus was ultimately charged with nine counts of first-degree murder and 14 counts of molestation and rape. As members of his family began to testify, many of whom were still loyal to him, the jury came to learn of the horrors Marcus had inflicted on his family. Marcus's defense was to claim that he didn't actually kill anyone, that Sabrina, the adult he had murdered, had actually pulled the trigger, murdering the children, and then turning the gun on herself. The evidence was ultimately inconclusive. There were no prints on the gun, but her DNA was. Her body was on top of all of the others, and the murder weapon was found underneath her body. However, it's not known if she lie where she fell, or if she was actually placed there, 
and the same could be said about the gun. The gunshot wound in her head was inconclusive as well. While consistent with a self-inflicted wound, a shot at close range couldn't be ruled out either. Ruby and Sophina's testimony showed that Marcus had complete control over the family and that he had commanded them to commit this act if the police ever tried to interfere. Having Serena kill the children, and then herself, would fit with this pattern of having a woman do the hard work while he walks away. On the other hand, family annihilators usually kill their families, then attempt to blame the crime on the mother. In the end, it didn't matter to the jury who actually pulled the trigger. Marcus Wesson was found guilty on all counts, and on June 27, 2005, he was sentenced to 102 years for the rape and molestation charges. For the murder of his children and grandchildren, he received the death penalty. Marcus was sent to San Quentin Prison, the nation's largest death row. In March of this very year, California Governor Gavin Newsom signed a moratorium on the death penalty, sparing Marcus Wesson's life. He will never be sentenced to death. Thankfully, however, he will never be eligible for parole. Elizabeth and their surviving children, now grown, have come to see how brainwashed they really were and how delusional, psychotic, and narcissistic Marcus really was. They have all tried to heal and move on with their lives as best as they can. They no longer have any contact with Marcus but the memories of their sick, depraved childhood as part of Marcus Wesson's vampire cult will never be forgotten.